Okay. Hi, welcome back, everybody. Um, so I'm going to try and speak for maybe um, 15 to 20 minutes about molecular properties and spectra using density functional theory and time dependent density functional theory. And then I will get two of my group members, uh, I think uh, Leo Cunha and Juan Arias to introduce the two exercises that you'll then be doing for roughly the remaining 20 minutes as we try and uh, get back on time to finish by 1.30. <clears throat> All right, so um, so um, um, the outline here will be a, a brief introduction to molecular properties, um, followed by um, showing you a bit of data and a, you know just really kind of a little bit of a of a you know summary of recent research about what DFT can do for different types of molecular properties. Um, well, a molecular property is simply how a molecule responds to something that stresses it. So an applied field or an applied perturbation of some kind, an electric field, a magnetic field, moving a nucleus, um, this kind of stuff. So we can say that the Hamiltonian is then um, modified by, um, um, by a, a stressing, a, a stressor, the V1 term, and, um, and we, we then can at look at the response at first order. So this would then be the linear response. Um, the most prominent examples of linear responses are electric dipole moments and nuclear forces. And then if we go um, in the red is exact, um, i.e. you can't do it, um, expression for first order properties. Um, the exact expression for first order properties is just the expectation value of the perturbing operator over the um, unperturbed wave function. And, um, and then one should say that, um, that one can also recast um, the, um, the, the first order property equally well as simply the derivative with respect to the, uh, apply, the strength of the applied stress shown as lambda here. So DED lambda will give you that, um, that response. Um, so those are first order properties. And then second order properties um, include molecular magnetizabilities, shielding, um, and the force constants that are so important in characterizing stationary points. Um, <clears throat> And in red is the formally exact expression for second order properties. It involves any second order perturbing operator. And then most trickily, the first order perturbed wave function, which in, in perturbation theory is a sum of all the exact excited states of the unperturbed system. So that's completely intractable. <clears throat> but what is tractable is to do the second derivative of the energy. Um, and so since these properties are expressible as energy derivatives, the analytic evaluation of those derivatives is, is itself possible. And, and <clears throat> I think it's not an understatement to say that analytic derivatives have transformed quantum chemistry. And the <clears throat> person that we should pay most tribute to in that is Peter Poulet, who in the late 1960s, so more than 50, over 50 years ago, um, um, basically introduced um, the, the SCF analytic gradient. <clears throat> and so the analytic gradient is um, efficient, um, it's precise, it's numerically accurate in other words, and it's relatively easy to implement. And so first order properties generally look like this. Um, there is the one electron Hamiltonian perturbed by the stress lambda traced out with the one particle density matrix P there is any change to the overlap derivatives that is induced by the perturbation um, traced out with the energy weighted density W. And then there is any change to the two body Hamiltonian G traced out with the two electron integral with the two particle density matrix gamma. Um, and um, <clears throat> analytic second derivatives or Hessians are um, less efficient. That is um, while first order properties have compute cost that scales exactly the same way with system size as the ground state energy itself. Second order properties, at least most of them, um, will scale one power of system size higher because you're typically making a quantity that itself scales with system size. And you can then write out the terms and that's, you can see it's difficult to implement. You need the density responses, P lambda, for instance, and the two particle density responses, gamma lambda, and the energy weighted density responses, W lambda. These are the things that make second order properties difficult. 
but enough of all this math. Let's um, let's get on to some chemistry. And, um, and so um, let me just give you a, a snippet of information about first order properties. And the simplest first order property is the dipole moment. This essentially is the first moment of the electron density. So this is one of the simplest ways to measure the quality of an electron density. And uh, remember the, um, the statement that I showed you about density functional theory straying from the true path earlier today. Well, <clears throat> looking at dipole moments is one way to test it, not just for spherical atoms, but for molecules. And so in red is some wave function methods, and then density functionals arranged by rungs on Jacob's ladder. So rung one, rung two, rung three, rung four A, rung four B, rung five A, rung five B. And, um, and if you just sort of look at the best method at each level, you can see that Jacob's ladder broadly is respected in terms of quality of dipole moments. And the quality of dipole moments with the best density functionals approaches coupled cluster with singles and doubles. So, <clears throat> so this is really quite good. Molecular geometries are even better because there is great cancellation of errors in nuclear forces to get optimized geometries. And, of course, you heard all about how to do the optimizations and worked on an exercise or two there earlier. So that's first example. Um, the, I want to focus a little more on second order properties. So they, that's where the link to spectra really comes in. So infrared, NMR spectra, um, there are other kinds as well, but these are maybe the two main ones. So, um, so let's just get started with um, infrared spectra. Um, the, um, <clears throat> the quality of harmonic vibrational frequencies that you get out from density functional theory um, depends somewhat on the functional you pick. It also depends somewhat on the geometry you pick. The most standard thing is to use geometries that are optimized with the density functional that you use to compute the frequencies. That's what's denoted as opt G in this figure here. And, um, <clears throat> and then you could also use um, towards the best geometry, um, and that's TBG. And you can see that the root mean square error for different density functionals, again, arranged by rungs on Jacob's ladder here from left to right, um, depends on which geometry you pick. The results are worse if you use the optimized geometries from your density functional, as opposed to using the theoretically best geometries. Um, but if we just concentrate on the way you would typically do it, which is the blue bars, you can see that rung two is, signif is, is significantly poorer than rung, free, rung three. We're comparing um, the harmonic calculated frequencies against harmonic benchmark frequencies here. So this is an apples to apples comparison. Any error that shows up is solely due to the exchange and correlation functionals not being exact. Um, you can also see that going from rung three to rung four A gives you very, just very slight improvement, not much. And also you might notice that the classic functional B3 lib is pretty much as good as any other functional here. Nothing's much better than that. And um, going to rung four B, you notice that things are not much worse, but they're definitely not better either. Um, so Jacob's ladder is not quite fully respected here. So when you are thinking about computing harmonic frequencies, um, if, if the, um, and this is for a set of covalently bonded molecules, you can't do much better than, um, than b 3 lit um, even today. It's quite interesting to see. If you go to non-covalent um, interactions, um, as for instance applied to the EDA, methods that Ueji was just telling you about, um, you see a rather different picture. Using the optimized geometries, there are quite significant errors in the high frequencies. These are above a thousand wave numbers. With GGAs, they come down quite respectably with meta GGAs. Again, not much, if any, improvement at the optimized geometry with um, either hybrid GGAs or hybrid meta GGAs. But you do see some advantage for omic, you know, for our dispersion corrected density functions here, which are the best of the hybrids for frequencies on the non covalent set. So, anyways, yeah. So these are a little bit expensive to compute. We will do an exercise that I think um, uh, Leo Cunha will introduce for you about. Um, doing some frequencies on a nice model system, um, and um, and you'll get to play with QCOM's capabilities here yourself. To compare against experiment, um, you 
you are not comparing anymore against harmonic frequencies. You're comparing to the real vibrations of the real molecule and real vibrations are anharmonic. Um, and, um, and so it's, it's common to scale vibrational frequencies computed harmonically to get the best agreement possible for, anharm you know, for direct comparison with the experiment. And it's kind of interesting to see the scale factors for frequency and for zero point energy. B3LIP stands out as having a scale factor of, well, basically one for zero point energy. Yet real zero point energies come from anharmonic frequencies, whereas B3LIP ZPEs come from harmonic ones. So this gives rise to the um, well-known expression that B3LIP is too good, it's doing better than it should, since the scale factor for ZPEs is basically one. The RMSs in wave numbers here are also impressively small for a range of methods. Again, we we don't see anything that much beats B3LIP, especially with dispersion corrections. Other methods are roughly comparable, you know, almost comparably good, but not as good. So that's interesting. That's a, a few takeaways on frequencies. Uh, you won't be doing an exercise on NMR, but NMR is a very important um, molecular property, and QCAM has uh, NMR evaluation, you know, DFT um, and wave function methods for NMR spectral prediction. And here's some data from a recent paper from my group um, looking at basis set convergence um, as well as functional dependence of NMR predictions. Um, the dashed line here is what is considered to be high accuracy, 0.1 ppm for proton chemical shifts, roughly one ppm for carbon chemical shifts. And if you look at a standard GGA like B97-D, um, and we're here we're basically looking at basis set size, the PCS type basis sets, um, you see that even at the basis set limit, none of these are chemically accurate with B97-D. MP2 is really the way to go for proton chemical shifts, and it's also pretty, pretty good as well for um, carbon-13 chemical shifts. For DFT, it is useful to go to the PCS1 basis level of basis set and not much beyond in terms of optimizing the trade-off between cost and accuracy. Anyway, um, that's just a snippet about NMR. Um, I then want to um, spend a few minutes talking about excited states and then we'll switch gears and do the exercises. Um, so um, uh, electronic excited states, I don't have time to go through the theory, but time dependent DFT amounts to the, the response you get by tickling a molecule with a, with a, um, with a monochromatic um, perturbing radiation field and asking at what tickled frequencies do you get a divergent response? Those are the poles of the response function. And, uh, and that leads to what are called the Cassida equations for TDDFT. And TDDFT, by solving the Cassida equations to get the poles of the linear response, this is the workhorse for computing UV vis spectra. And your second exercise will be a, um, a UV vis spectral um, calculation that I think Juan Arias will introduce to you. He's a student in my group who, um, who finished setting up this very nice exercise. Um, and, um, and then here's a little data just showing you um, how well does standard TDDFT do um, across, uh, across the Jacobs ladder hierarchy. This is organized by quality of prediction here um, and um, uh, for and, and essentially what one sees is that, um, is that BMK, a, a fairly vintage hybrid functional and, and omega B97X-D, another vintage hybrid functional, are both quite good, errors of a, about 0.3 or less. And there are a bunch of other functionals that come very close for uh, this kind of RMS error. Um, and so that's the sort of best case for um, TDDFT. Um, there are some cases where TDDFT fails disastrously, and I'm illustrating one of them here in the bob in the in the um, in the angled stripe bars, um, showing TDDFT for charge transfer excitation, moving an electron from ammonia to fluorine, separated by a thousand angstroms, and you see the results vary all the way from roughly zero energy cost to move the electron, through to a pretty decent number, which is the hartree fock number of over 12 electron volts, because you've got to pay the ionization energy of ammonia. Um, and you see this tremendous sensitivity. So TDDFT breaks down due to these 
adiabatic approximation errors um, in charge transfer excited states and also core excited states. So for systems like that, or problems like that, you need to do something different. And one useful different thing to do is orbital optimized density functional theory, which QCAM has very nice capabilities for, leading capabilities for, in fact, um, and um, you see what happens if you do OODFT in the solid bars, all that functional sensitivity that you see in TDDFT for charge transfer states gets lost. And now we get reasonably reasonable invariance of the predicted result with respect to functional. And here's some core spectroscopy results. Again, the, um, uh, the, the diagonal bars, the bars with diagonal shading are the errors associated with um, TDDFT for promoting an electron from a 1s core orbital. You'll hear much more about core spectroscopy from Anna Krilov later, I think. Um, but this is just to show you that TDDFT has substantial errors for core spectroscopy. And look how beautifully they get cleaned up by doing OODFT. And what OODFT is, is simply um, applying um, orbital optimization to an open shell excited state, a targeted open shell singlet or triplet. And, um, and you get this tremendous more than order of magnitude drop in error. So, um, so again, very impressive. All right, well, um, to try and keep Simi on time, I'm gonna stop right now and turn it over to um, my group members to introduce the exercises and then on to the breakout room. So uh, that's it for me and, um, and thanks very much. I'll stop sharing and let Leo take over.